from leaders. Today, we are going to get the vision of someone who, who very much has workforce resilience under his remit on his daily working life. He's heading the security and company resilience agenda of a very large organization employing more than 70,000 people operating in 2,500 remote sites all over the world and sometimes in very difficult terrains. And as a matter of fact, that gentleman and me, we do have the same first name. So it's a double pleasure to have you with us, Cédric. Welcome. Good day, everyone. So, Cédric Morigi, you're the Head of Security and Company Resilience at Lafarge Holcim. What does that mean, being the head of that agenda at Lafarge Holcim? The global head is basically the person in charge of setting almost like an orchestra master. You are there to set up the music and make sure that everyone in the 70 countries where we operate are playing at the same time with the same quality of outcome. Uh, we decided to merge security and resilience, mainly because the way we see resilience is an element of preparedness of the company to respond to serious or unwanted catastrophic event. So as such, as Global Head of Security and Resilience, I, I make sure with my team and everyone in the countries that are reporting into the org chart that we do have the right response protocol in place against identified risks. On the topic of response protocol, and I mean, we know each other for, for a while, so I will allow myself uh, uh, to take one of the sentences that you used and that you poached from Mike Tyson. Huh? Yes, so, so Mike Tyson said everyone has a plan until he gets punched in the face. So have you been punched in the face um, uh, in the COVID times? I think we've been punched in the face every single day, right? Whoever whoever is not clever enough or open-minded enough to realize that they can be small punch, big punch, um, you never learn from your mistakes. So yes, we have. In my previous company, Rio Tinto, we had a beautiful pandemic plan. And when we moved to, to La Farge Rossim, we kind of took it, not as it is obviously, but you know, with, what, with our experience and we rebuilt a, a, a similar one very simple. None of them would have worked for the pandemic. So all the amount of work that we've put in Rio Tinto at the time I was there to build up, to prepare a plan against pandemic would have failed day one because the plan was not adapted at all to what was happening. So that's the first punch in the face from an academic point of view. The second punch in the face is when we wanted really to, to launch the resilience uh, in La Farge against pandemic, we had 15,000 staff in Wuhan at the time. Um, a lot of people took me for a fool. And not only I took a punch in the face, but I took multiple punches in the face, in the stomach, obviously in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic point of view, right? because no one was believing us that something catastrophic was, was happening. And uh, I, was, I was waiting to be punched uh, you know, from a, from a manager point of view, because I've, I've, I've prepared the company, we prepared the plan, we briefed CEOs, we, but we went above what they were expecting us to do because no one at the top level gave me the blessing. In fairness to them, no one stopped me either, right? They said, well, you're the head, just do it. So I went to talk to the CEO and, and our CEO has a reputation of you know saying the stuff the way they are. And he looked at me and he said, so what do we do? And I looked at him, so what do you mean? He said, well, we have a conference with 300 people coming from all around the world next month. What is your advice? Do we cancel it? We postpone it or we keep it? And I said, as a head of security and resilience, I think we can still do it because the information we have make us believe that even if the virus is spreading, the likelihood that we will close everything is very low at the moment in time. However, one case will be enough to put all of us in quarantine in Davos, that would be in Davos. And he said, and as an individual, I said, I wouldn't do it. He said, why is that? I said, there's fears around the world and you're going to ask, we're going to ask 300 leaders, men, husband, father, mother, to travel around the world in that time of uncertainty. The meeting will not go down well. And I could see him because he was waiting for that meeting to, to launch something and announce something. And he said, all right, we cancel the meeting. The three months were or two and a half months where we had to every day get punched, criticized, 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 challenged, up to the CEO saying, yep, yeah, we cancel, we back you up. And by the way, I want you in my office tomorrow. We're starting the global BRT. And the other, the last point is, is every time we got someone sick in the company, 
because of COVID. Because despite everything we've put in place, despite, and thank you to ISOS, you've helped us a lot. And you also ranked us one of the top company when it comes to responding to COVID. I mean, we've put so much effort, so much energy. And every time we have one of our employees which is sick or, or an employee who passed away because of COVID, we had no because of COVID transmitted at, at site level. But it was because of individual cutting it from the communities. It's a punch in the face because it's a sense of failure. What is, and I know you're, you're a teacher as well, huh? on, 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 the, on the parallel life. Uh, so um, what is your definition of workforce resilience? Now we can write white papers of what is business workforces, business resiliency and recovery capabilities, etc. At the end of the day, it's simply the capacity of our staff to adapt and perform into their own or new environment. Uh, as a professor at universities, I've seen a lot of my professor peers trying to overcomplicate it definition. I've seen other head of function, global head of function like myself, trying to overcomplicate it problems. So you don't fix a problem in one go, you slice it in things that we can chew and digest. However, as Churchill said, I apologize for writing such a long note. I didn't have time to write a shorter note. Right? Because writing short and being simple needs a lot of preparedness. And that preparedness is not about writing Bibles or dictionary. No one would read that. For us, I can anticipate your question. So in that case, what did you do? For us, it's about communicating the right thing, exposing the problem, the right way, allowing them to provide ideas and then moving that into action. And this is what we call the three I A. The three I, I for what are the information I have. The second I is what issues will be generated by those information. The third I is what ideas do I have? And once you have your list of information, issues and ideas, then you move on. What are the actions I'm going to take? What are the key issues you foresee for the workforce resilience of corporate organizations in the next month? So let's use the three I approach to, to answer your question, right? Okay. Um, so what information do we have? Information number one, from a health point of view, we know that long COVID exists. It will have impact on our workforces. Other information that we have, vaccine at this moment in time, as of the 19th of March, the statistical vaccination at world level is still completely insignificant. We're at less than 6%. Third information, we know that the COVID will not be defeated by the vaccine. It will be contained. So it will come back and it will come back and it will come back again. Fourth one, the people are exhausted. People are tired. People are fed up. People are becoming complacent. People want their life back. So, okay, what issue does that mean? It means because of long COVID and because of all the collateral non-identified disease or, or sickness, uh, so we will have staff absenteeism rising. We might have staff being sick, as we've never seen before. We might have staff that goes in burnout. And all that has massive consequence on, first of all, the health and safety of our people. But at the end of the day, the production of the company, because we do not produce anything without our people. What about the issue about people are complacent, fed up, upset? I don't know for you guys, but a couple of years ago, I had what we call life jacket. You, you, I was traveling, I was going to the pub with my friends sometime. I was allowed to just take a plane and go somewhere. Not, none of that exists anymore. So my, my, my zone of comfort became my house, but it's so tiny that anything that can disrupt that is increasing my how nervous I am. It's increasing my tension. It's increasing my aggressivity. And if you look around you, the amount of aggressivity we have, it's starting to make us doubt in the government. We see fake news floating up right and center. What ideas? Ideas working with ISOS on, on well-being. Ideas sending survey to your employees to, to make them feel that you're really interested in how they are. And not only sending a survey, but saying, you know what, we're going to send a survey and then we're going to put some action in place. Having phone calls with your staff, increasing the Zoom conference, sending them gifts for their birthday, doing like we did, conferences not only for them, but for them and their family and their church and their schools and their friends and their football club. We did session on how to help yourself and your family stay safe during COVID. How do you help yourself and your family be more well-being orientated or have less post-traumatic incident because of COVID? And we having those, we're giving those time to the employees during the time of work or the evening where anyone can join. So how can we give something to them? And then the action is very, those are all ideas I give. The action is very simple. I talk to ISOS, I book Anthony Rancho, I define 
within what, what scope and what material will be done, and we provide it. We, the action is, I run a survey, but not only I run the survey, when the survey arrives, we look at the data, we assess the data, we activate an employee assistance program, we train employees on being more resilient. In La Farge Sim, we created a new resiliency program, which is divided in three colors, the brown, silver, and the gold, which is helping the employee through our own training material to be certified as business resident specialist, level one, two, and three. And that as soon as they hit level three, we're giving them the opportunity to go and receive a master's degree from a university. Obviously, they will have to attend the courses, etc., to become business resilience expert. Why is that? Because the resiliency is not about security, it's about resiliency of our people and the business. So on the long term, we can play as much as we want with business impact assessment, the famous BIA and all those great theory. But the individual, if our individual is not resilient, we can forget about all the rest. Get your, get your information right, not the fake news. Get the right ideas, identify your right issues, then move into a very simple action plan and community communicate with your staff and tell them, you know what, we're going to do that together. Looking at the near future, do you see that uh, COVID, this type of approach will change, uh, maybe not necessarily Lafarge, I'm speaking about all organizations, will change the organizational framework of companies, will change org charts, will change, change remits of HR, health and safety, resilience, security. Do you see changes to be to be done in organization, generally speaking? I don't think so. I would hope so, but I don't think so. I think if the humankind will be efficient in learning from the past, we will know about it. We believe we do, but we don't. We keep repeating the same mistakes. I was in discussion yesterday with one of our top three in the company about uh, what we call the tsunami, uh, natural disaster slash tsunami risk. So he said, Cedric, do you know that in Japan, most of the, the port in Japan will have stones with a white line? And he said that white line has been the line of where was the last level of water for the last tsunami. And he said the older generation knew that by heart. And they knew that then the when the water will retract from shore, the first thing they have to do is not to run to pick up shell. It's actually to run away from the water and go above that point. The new generation never learned from that. And this is why they had so many fatalities in Japan during the last tsunami 2004 and 5. I, I, love, I love people saying that organizational learning. You can adapt your governance. This is what we're doing at the moment. We're spending a lot of time in, in adapting our governance based on the learning of COVID, just to make sure that it's there. We're building the success of La Farge Sim was, and I think that goes really well into the workforce resiliency in building bridges, which is a paradox, right? We are we are a cement and building company and we used to be siloed. And the success of how we've run COVID was building bridges. I got 14 function reporting into my stream business resilience stream. We build it up bridges in between all of us. So uh, so you're teaching at edX. So you're teaching a new generation that that uh, will be leaders later. In a, in in your ideal view, what are the bridges to be built in organizations to increase that workforce resilience? I was at school when the teacher was coming in. We had to stand up and look at the teacher when the teacher was talking to us, was straightening the eyes, etc. Right? You go to edX. You got the ultimate cream of the cream. They they pay 30, 40,000 pounds a year for that MBA or master. They don't look at you. They look at their computer or their phone. And I was, well, what's happening? Right? And the professor, the titular professor, Bertrand, Professor Bertrand Monet, which I'm, I'm, I'm his associate professor, was there and said, don't worry, don't worry, let them do. It. Check, ask them some question, you'll see. All right, so I was asking questions, all of a sudden hands will go up. Look at me, gave the answer and go back. Literally, right? iPhone, computer, headset, me talking, asking question, they were answering. Therefore, it means they were listening to what I was saying. It's almost like if they became multitask with digital. When you and I, or at least let's talk for myself, I'm not really multitask with technology, not yet. My children, 10, 11, 12, they know better how to use their iPhone than I do. And I'm a bloody head of cybersecurity too. So I'm technology savvy. I got a degree in IT. I, I, I get it. But that they have... I think that that logic of building bridges in between humans is starting also by building bridges with technology. And that new generation, the challenge we're getting in bringing them into our organization, and I got a couple of millennium working for me, is how do we connect them with people like us or people older than us? I think the important question here is workforce resiliency. How, remember I told you last time we spoke, there's about 
what resilient, when resilient, who resilient. I don't need the workforce resiliency to be the same at every scale of the organization. I don't need my CEO to be brown, silver, gold in the resiliency program in the company. But I need my employees, any generation, to be resilient, brown, silver, and gold, because that resiliency will then translate into resiliency of the business. But I'm not going to teach resiliency to a 60 years old the same way I'm going to teach to a 24 years old. But the more we have different cultures, different colors of skin, different ethics, origin, different religion, different gender, of course, any type of gender, as long as you have more of that, you will increase your resiliency because we are much stronger together than fighting against each other. So that would be my conclusion of workforce resiliency, is diversity and the right communication. Vaccination is the hot topic that everybody's speaking about. Organizations are looking how to address vaccination. Should, should they address vaccination? Should they communicate? So what is your, what, what is your view on that? And if you believe employers have a role to play on COVID-19 vaccination, how do you see the communication topic of it? What is the company role in a vaccination program? The company role is, by definition, to support what the local authorities will do. But if they disagree with the local authorities, to take a very strong stand when it comes to maybe following what WHO would say or what the medical institution would say. And we're operating, as I said before, in 70 countries. So we can't have one size fits all approach. Uh, we still have countries like Tanzania, which do not recognize COVID and do not believe COVID exists and are formally refusing to provide vaccination to anyone. And they've made it become illegal to even provide an import vaccine in their country. And then on the north of Tanzania, you got Uganda, which is actually pushing for it. And we have operation on, on, on both sides, right? And so from a a communication point of view, what we decide in La Farge aussi, is we've made mandatory a vaccination program for every single country. Every single country must have a vaccination program which must follow a template. And the program, as a company, centrally, we do encourage, we do encourage every single employee to accept vaccination. We're not saying which vaccine, we're not saying what type of vaccine, we're not saying how, when, we're just saying we're encouraging you to take it because based on our scientific evidence and as the three i have before we are convinced that vaccination will help us to get out of the the woods however we also do know that employees will not be able some of them will not be able to take vaccine it's either they don't want to or they can't and the big challenge we're going to get now from a workforce resiliency is if you have people that cannot be vaccinated because of their valid medical reason allergic to aluminium or eggs you need to protect them it's not their fault the one who refused to be vaccinated for ethical, personal religion. We have a group of Catholic priests in one of the country where we operate, which are saying that the devil is inside the vaccine and no one should be vaccinated. So if we have staff in our team, in our operation that believe in the same thing, we will have to take a decision on who do we protect? Do we protect them because of their religious belief? Or do we protect the others which believe in science and trust the science doing right? Because if we don't choose one side, what's going to happen is Fear, tension, aggressivity might build up on the plant. We might end up in fight like companies had in the UK recently. There's been a fight within the company where people vaccinated and some refusing to be vaccinated started to clash. So the tactical response to that question needs to be approached, as I said before, in a very simplistic way. And the simplistic way is you must define what your local authorities allows you to do. So you must understand it. You must have a plan that is resilient enough to adapt to any change in your ecosystem. And the third one is proactive communication, constant proactive communication with staff. There's no other choice. You need to get them on board. But with actual information, reminding them that there's a lot of stuff on Facebook and YouTube they should not read. And if they read, they should forget about it. And if they can't forget about it, they can ask questions about it. But science is not on, on Facebook or YouTube. We have prepared something like 12 scenarios for our region and our countries. Each scenarios are reflecting what I just said. Employee E refused to be vaccinated, employee C or an international travel or specific. And each of those scenarios, we're giving them to the country and we're asking them to train their expo against those scenarios. Because the vaccination program is nothing else than how we will respond to staff, union, stakeholders, shareholders, when we're going to be asked the question about how do you respond to the vaccination challenges. 
looking at the future, does it mean that health will become a, a new strategic driver of, of corporate organizations, uh, a new key topic on the agenda of sea levels for the near future, for the, for, for the long run? So I need to be careful by answering this answer, this question because I will not talk on behalf of Lafarge also because else is a priority. Your question is not about Lafarge also, the question no, is about one. Yes. in general. And I will need to put my academic hat on and not the security and resilience one. I, I have to challenge, else is not the priority of the organization. It's not. Else is not the priority of the government. Um, I believe the priority is has been, and this is why we've been in lockdown, the priority has been to preserve and safeguard their medical infrastructure because we know that if we follow the Maslow pyramid of needs, the basic of that pyramid is healthcare. And if health healthcare fails, all the rest fails. I do believe that we have a new relationship to death that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. And we also have a new relationship to sharing with social media. If you look at the pandemic that happened in Hong Kong, in 1968 and 69 that people have completely forgotten about but it was discovered in 2003 i think they had about 10,000 people dying in paris december 1968 we don't talk about it now we didn't have the technology at the time to identify those threats so i i'm afraid to say it's for cosmetic reason that our governments and our our some of the companies are using health as as an element that's only one element at the end of the day that save a company is the balance sheet so it's i fully welcome the drive of having health being more important not misunderstanding i'm absolutely being in head of security and resilience means protecting people against against potentially death accident so that's that's drives me but i also need to be realistic unfortunately that's not the answer you were waiting But I have to, I have to be absolutely blunt and transparent. I do not believe that health will be the next key revolution in the human, in the society where we live. I think health will become the biggest, bigger challenge because, as we said before, there's a lot of underlying condition that that are there and that haven't been spotted. We're going to get more and more people being sick, more and more people being absentees, so suffer from absenteeism. So we will have to put health on top of the agenda but to guarantee production and efficiency and effectiveness, not to protect people else. I don't think so. As soon as we manage to accept that health is one of the key elements in productivity, I think we can do it. But for the time being, I'm just afraid it's one of the elements that will be looked at for a company to survive. Thank you very much, Cédric. And what a, a uh, inspiring opening for potentially another conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Wish you all the best. See you very soon. See you soon.